Put your phones on mute for vibrate. Take a break from life for a you know, half hour and enjoy this lecture. I'm very honored and delighted to present this guy tonight. This is the premiere of this book that's been in the works for about three years. But actually it starts about 66 years ago this summer when this man met Robert Allen Zimmerman, known as Bobby, to him at a Camp Herzl out in Webster, Wisconsin, okay. summer of 1953. We would meet another fellow there from right around here, Larry Keegan. How many people know the new Larry Keegan here? Larry Keegan was, uh, grew up in St. Paul, went to Herzl camp, met this guy, met Bobby. They became lifelong friends, stayed in touch throughout their lives. Many of those stories are in this book. It's an excellent read. I've read it. I love it. You're gonna. People from around here are going to be very familiar with things. There's a lot of St. Paul stuff. There's, it'll touch everybody. So pick it up and enjoy it. It just came out two days ago. Oh, sorry. It's not even, it's been shipped. It's not shipped yet tomorrow. A couple days. So I'd like to present to you, now from Los Angeles, born and raised in Duluth, author Louis Kemp. Somebody refers me to me as an author. I have to look around and see who they're talking about. Because I spent my whole life as a fish peddler you know, from, from Duluth, you know, in Alaska. So this is a, a new experience for me to be an author, and, and I'm enjoying it. Okay, right there. Okay. So this book starts, like Mark said, at Herzl Camp. And I'm going to read you excerpts from some of the chapters. In the opening, paragraph of the book is this. It was at summer camp in northern Wisconsin in 1953 that I first met Bobby Zimmerman from Hibby. He was 12 years old and he had a guitar. He would go around telling everybody that he was going to be a rock and roll star. I was 11 and I believed it. Yeah. And, you know, Bobby uh, had the mindset right from the beginning that that's what he was going to be, and, and and he made it happen. Obviously, he went far beyond being a rock and roll star. He passed that up a long time ago, you know, becoming uh, the voice of generations, an icon, and uh, this little thing called the Nobel Prize in Literature. So, and many, many other uh, accolades and awards, none of which he had recorded or, 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 or thought about. I'm going to read you the last part of the, of the Herzl Camp chapter, uh, which kind of shows you he was 17. We were there for five years in a row. And this was the last year that we were there. Another performance that I remember fondly took place on a warm afternoon a few summers later in 1957. This was the traditional day when the campers took on the roles of the consulates. The idea was to teach us responsibility, leadership, and cooperation. All qualities that my two friends and I generally lacked. Bobby took the place of Shlomo, the music director. Though he had often beaten the poor old piano to death with impromptu performances inside the activities room, Bobby had never played his guitar on top of the building. Now, Seven years before Fiddler on the Roof would open on Broadway, he proceeded to do just that. <laughs> All day long, silhouetted against the sun, Bobby played every rock and roll, blues song anybody had ever heard of, and lots that we hadn't. Larry and I kept him supplied with water and requests. As all day long, kids would stop by to listen in the courtyard below. Seeing Bobby on the roof in full performance mode, like a maestro at Carnegie Hall, convinced me that nothing could, would, or should ever stop him. He was our fiddler on the roof. And this would become the indelible image of the last days of our childhood. Bobby didn't look anything like the vapidly handsome blonde pop stars of the day. He looked like a skinny little Jewish kid who'd never be anybody's bet to conquer the world 
but that's exactly what he did. So there's a famous story that people know about that uh, Buddy Holly played in Duluth three days before he died in a plane crash in, in Iowa in a blizzard. So Bobby and I went to that concert together, and I, and I write about that here, and I'll share that with you. The most important show to Bobby that year, though, was not one of his own performances. It was a show he seemed to know he would never get to see again. The date was January 31st, 1959. It was a Saturday night, and with the wind chill, the temperature of Duluth was minus 44 degrees. <laughs> now you know why I live in Los Angeles. <laughs> the car we drove was my dad's 58 metallic blue Buick. Bobby was 17, I was 16. And we were on our way to see what well, would be one of Buddy Holly's last concerts. He was 22. And it was just three days before he Richie Valance and the Big Bopper would perish in a plane crash while taking off in an Iowa blizzard. Another great, Waylon Jennings, would have been on that list had he not given up his seat to the Big Bopper. Waylon was, was an unknown that he was uh, 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 in, in Buddy's uh, traveling van on that tour. This day, to this day, whenever Buddy Holly's classic Oh boy, comes on the radio. I feel the hairs on the back of my neck snap to attention. The words seek to be emulated from his soul straight to my heart. This was my favorite song all through high school. Bobby's musical interest was much wider and deeper than mine. Even as a child, he faithfully listened to late night radio stations from the South something that Buddy Howard had been doing in Lubbock, Texas just a few years before. When I think about it, there, was, there never seemed to be a time when Bobby had not been a big fan of Buddy's. There was no doubt that the rock and roll pioneer was a seminal influence in Bobby's musical life. There were many similarities between Buddy and Bobby, but one that Bobby probably wasn't aware of was that they each had a high school girlfriend named Echo, which is a very unusual name, and they both had it. They both had it. It's widely known that one of Bob's classic songs, Girl from the North Country, was written about his girlfriend, Echo Helstra. We arrived at the Duluth National Guard Army for something called the Winter Dance Party and found the tickets to be pretty pricey, ranging from a a buck twenty-five all the way up to two dollars. Well, that was real money in 1959. You could go to a movie for 15, 20 cents. Yeah. So, two bucks? No, it's good money. It was real money. We pulled our resources and shoved our way in, working our way through the dancing, partying throng of 2,000 excited, withering young people. With Bobby in the lead, we snaked our way right up to the edge of the stage, mere feet away from Buddy as he performed. As a side note, I'm going up to Duluth on Thursday, and they're taking me over to the Army to show them the exact spot where Bobby and I stood during that concert so they could mark it. As still as a statue, Bobby stood there, mesmerized, never taking his eyes off of Buddy. Perhaps time has embellished my memory of that night, but Buddy seemed to be smiling down on Bobby with an almost celestial countenance. At one point, he nodded to Bobby, seemingly as if he knew his own remaining time was brief and that Bobby would one day take up his mantle as one of the greatest musical artists of the world. Only four years later was Bobby Wright blowing in the wind and start fulfilling that prophecy, just four years later. Wow. I have always believed that a spiritual connection of some kind 
was forged that night between Buddy, and Buddy Holly and Bobby Zimmerman. Though no one in the crowd was aware of it, I only know what I saw. And it looked a lot like a torch beat past. That was a night to remember. And needless to say, only three days later, we were all shocked and uh, very despaired when we found out that the, the buddy and the other two passed away in the play because we couldn't believe it. The day the music died. Yeah, that's what they call it, the day the music died. So, I went to UMD for a couple of years and I transferred out to the main U. And uh, I went that I was in the fire swamp part of the UMD. And I was staying in the house. And Bobby had already left for New York. I mean, hitchhiked out of Minneapolis. Went to the end, he went to the edge of I-35 during a blizzard. He had five bucks in his sock and uh, his guitar and a grip with him. And, you know, he started hitchhiking. And, uh, you know, he, he first went to Madison and then got a ride to, uh, to New York. So this story, it's kind of a true story, I like it, is during that time when, when I had transferred on to the main youth. From the time I was around 13, I was a champion arm wrestler, able to beat everyone my age, even the football players and weightlifters, as well as many of my teachers and counselors. One day I was in the process of arm wrestling the whole fraternity, one after another, usually slamming their arms down in seconds. One of my frat brothers, a great guy, unfortunately has passed away, I was there, named Paul Goldstein, saw that I was mowing down the guys and decided he wanted to show me up. He went and found his friend, Carl Allen. <laughs> the All-American Defensive End for the Golden Gophers who later became an all-pro star for the Vikings and an NFL Hall of Famer. Because of his size and strength, everybody called Carl Moose. Paul invited Moose to come over and destroy me. And I guess the guy figured it would be a fun piece of cake. When I looked up to see how many more victims lay ahead of me, I was astounded to see Moose in the line about seven guys back. He had his arms crossed over his chest and stared grimly in my direction, which made me break out in a big smile. And sweat. <laughs> Let's see how good you are now, big shot, Paul cackled. Moose waited his turn. When he got to the front of the line and sat down across from me, I had to admit, he was pretty intimidating. His hand looked more like a club. And when he locked it with mine, my elbow dangled six inches off the table. I didn't leave. I was, I was getting for this. I had never seen an arm as big as his. Anyway, I called for someone to bring over some phone books, and I put them under my elbow to get some leverage and footing. Then we got to it, each of us trying hard to conquer the other. My frat brothers were all screaming and yelling, some for me and some chanting, moose, moose, moose. He, he was the big guy on campus. He was, we're talking 1962. He, he was the, the local hero. Bets were thrown, and everyone betting on me got big odds. It was brother against brother, just like in Civil War times. And the profanities were flying. Our arms waved back and forth a couple of inches each way, as the veins in our necks popped and our faces turned bet, beet red. We huffed and puffed, groaned and moaned, and after about five minutes, which is a long time in arm wrestling, it seemed obvious that neither of us were, were going to fold. We mutually decided to call the job to the amazement of the crowd. Yeah. 
and to, to this day, that's one of my accomplishments in life, to have it. Right. I don't know if Marlo ever had his pride uh, to a tie. Oh, yeah. I'm going to ask my kids to put that on my kitchen. Uh, after the epic showed up, whenever I saw Carl on campus, he came over and shook my hand. You are one tough Jew boy, <laughs> which, which is a big compliment coming from the booth. <laughs> so this story takes part the place in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Coming off, the, off Tour 74, Bobby's creative juices were flowing big time. When I came back from Alaska in July, I went to see Bobby at his place outside Minneapolis. And he played me the songs he had written. These songs would constitute his critically acclaimed album, Blood on the Tracks. One of his greatest albums. And I was one of the first people to hear them. Not only that, here, he sat two feet in front of me, playing them to me. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young are playing tonight in St. Paul, he said. Do you want to go with me? We went to the concert, which, is at the, which was at the St. Paul Civic Center. Afterwards, we went to the hotel where the band was staying. Bill Graham and Barry Emhoff were the tour promoters. So we had a chance to see him visit with them again. After a while, Bobby mentioned to Stephen Stills he had just written some new songs. And of, a, and of course, Stephen wanted to hear them. So Bobby, Stephen, and I went into the bedroom of the suite, and Bobby played a few things. Stephen was obviously wilted. <laughs> And when Bobby sang Idiot he became paranoid and very agitated. You wrote that song about me, he shouted. Why did you write that song about me? He jumped up and got right in Bobby's face. As Bobby's friend and self-appointed protector, I jumped in between them so Stephen couldn't get any closer. Carefully, I eased Stephen back. Bobby just laughed and said, relax, man, the song's not about you. As he continued to sing and strum without missing a beat. Millions of people around the world identify personally with Bobby's songs and feel as if he is speaking directly to them. A few of them are loaded enough to think the songs are actually written about them. <laughs> so I, I remember that thing very vividly. As I remember all this very vividly. Thank God. Uh, God has given me a, a good memory. And all this, of course, I didn't have any notes on it, this book. It's, it's all for my So there was a, favorite, a famous concert that was memorialized by a movie that uh, Martin Scorsese shot of the concert. It's called The Last Waltz. <laughs> and it made me a rock uh, movie. And of course the concert was amazing. So this, this is a chapter in the book. It's entitled appropriately The Last Waltz. Bill Graham was a big fan of smoked Lake Superior trout. I had introduced him to while we were on Tour 74. From time to time, he would ask me if he could buy some for me. But of course I said there was no way I'd sell it to him. He didn't feel right about it. I was willing to give it to him, but you know, he, he, and I gave it to him a few times and then he, he started to feel like, uh, you know, he was a, you know, a beggar or so, so. He didn't feel right about taking it for free, so he said, 
let's make a deal. How about you send me the smoke trial and I give you concert tickets whenever you want? Deal. When the Rolling Stones played Minneapolis, he gave me the best seats in the house. I took all my friends. They were so happy and impressed. We were right off. Is that the 70s? 72 or 72? No, no, it was the head of the I met Bill in 74, so it's probably 75. And when he was planning the band's final concert to be called The Last Walls, he contacted me. It went without saying that I'd be at the show, but that wasn't why he called me. He told me the band was planning a Thanksgiving feast at the venue prior to the concert. Would I provide some salmon for it? Sure, I said, consider it a gift for me and Bobby. True to my word, I provided 300 pounds of Alaskan king salmon <laughs> for the last balls. Compliments of the boys from the North Country. Exactly. All right. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> the day before the concert, Bobby and I flew up to San Francisco. We had booked rooms at the my Powell Hotel. where a lot of the concert people were staying. We agreed to meet up in the lobby and go over to Winterland together for the show. At the point in time, I went down to meet Bobby, but he wasn't there yet. So I looked around for a place to wait. I spotted an empty chair next to a distinguished looking black man. We greeted each other. And after a while, a little while, Bobby came down. He saw me and started in my direction. But when he was about 10 feet away, he started laughing. I went over to meet him, and as we walked towards the door, Bobby was still chuckling. That, he said, is one of the funniest sights I've ever seen. What, I asked in this one. Muddy Waters and Louie kept sitting together. <laughs> That was Muddy Waters? Who knew? <laughs> Winterland was quite a scene. Bill had decorated the hall spectacularly, borrowing sets for La Traviata. There were tables with mounds of delicious looking food, including the salmon we provided. The show had sold out in one day, and the place was brimming with 5,400 fans. Today, Thanks in no small part to Martin, no small part to Martin Scorsese's epic film of the event, everybody knows who played at the concert. Among others, and aside from the band, there was Neil Young, Neil Diamond, Joni Mitchell, Van Morrison, Muddy Waters, my new friend, <laughs> Paul Butterfield, Eric Clapton, Ringo Starr, Bobby Charles, Rodney Hawkins, Dr. John, Stephen Stills, my nemesis, Ron Wood, and last but definitely not least, Bobby, the musician's musician. It seemed that all the artists wanted to talk to Bobby, and he was friendly and gracious in every way. Governor Jerry Brown was backstage and took the opportunity to fawn over him. Bobby just remained Bobby, laid back, and taking it all in. In order to get his film bankrolled, Scorsese had had to promise a headliner. When he dropped Bob's name, Warner Brothers had quickly forked over the cash, an understanding that Bobby would be a highlight of the film. At the time, Bobby was edit editing the movie we shot to Rolling Thunder with Ronaldo and Clara. Bobby's appearance in the Scorsese film concerned how it all was working with Bobby on the editing and development of that project. Would Bobby's appearance in the last walls be trapped from the impact of their own movie? Bobby thought about this, and just before the concert began, he gave Bill Graham an ultimatum. I don't want all my songs to be filmed, he said. Just two of them. 
I'm going to put Louie on the stage next to you and Marty. He will tell you when you can film me. Bill freaked out. But Bobby would not relent. He was planning to perform four songs and he could film only the last two. There I stood, the enforcer, next to Marty, Bill, Jonathan Tappan, the producer. The cameraman took their marching orders from Scorsese, of course, but I was tasked with getting them to turn their cameras away from Bobby and come down from their towers during his early numbers. After that, they could scamper their back up and shoot as they please. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> the lights went down and Bobby came out to a thundering ovation. He danced around the stage as he performed a lively, rousing rendition of Baby, Let Me Follow You Down. The crowd went wild. Then he moved right into Hazel from Planet Waves. Near the end of it, I told the old Marty to get ready and signaled the cameramen to get back on their perches and, and swing their cameras around. The cameras rolled as Bobby launched into his third song. I don't believe you. She acts like we never had met. And kept going through, through to his fourth, forever young. That one really brought the house down. That was supposed to be the end of the set, but Bobby calls his own shots, and he decided to swing back into the first song, Baby, Let Me Fall You Down. Much to the surprise of everybody, including the band. When I realized what was happening, I told Marty and Bill to turn off the cameras. Marty pretended he didn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> the Bill went completely bonkers. Screw you, he shouted. Actually, he said much worse than that, but I don't want to put it in there. Roll the damn cameras. Roll them. Right there, as Bobby was performing, Bill and I got into a yelling and shoving match. We actually had our hands on each other's shirts and we were pushing back and forth and screaming at each other in their faces. Back off, Bill screamed. This is history, man. Don't mess with it. This is my show. I understood where Bill was coming from. I knew him to be a volatile guy accustomed to controlling everything in his universe. He was very intense. He resented Bobby and me telling him what he could or could not do at his own show. But I had a job to do and I was trying like hell to do it. That part caused Bobby to glance over at me, like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> then he went back to hypnotizing the audience with his artistry as I continued trying to fend off Bill and shut down the camera crew. By the time Bobby gave the crowd yet another gift by performing I Shall Be Released, none of these last songs were playing, with the, uh, released with the band and a bunch of other artists, a whole bunch of other artists came on stage because this was the, the last song of the night. I've given up trying to stop the inevitable. After the show, I explained to Bobby what had happened. In his usual fashion, he said, it's okay, Louie, you did a good job. All right. <laughs> Bobby's manager, right from the beginning, early on, was a, a very famous manager in the business. His name is Albert Grossman. And uh, he managed you know, the biggest people of that day, you know, Janice Joplin, Peter Paul Mary, and the list goes on and on. And he was a, he was a tough guy. And uh, this story is, is about Bobby. And, uh, the, the title of this chapter is Nobody Beats the Bear. An indicator of what kind of manager Elver Grossman was going to be came in the mid-60s after a mutual friend had taken Bobby 
the Andy Warhol studio in New York, known as the Factory. Andy was a big fan of Bobby's and gave him one of his life-size silk screens, the one called Double Elvis. It's a famous picture. That piece is well known and widely reproduced nowadays, but Bobby wasn't worried about it. Perhaps that's why he and his pal Bobby Newell was attached to the roof of the station wagon and drove to Woodstock with it flapping like a bat. <laughs> To be fair, at the time, Bobby is only a few years removed from Hibby. And not very tuned in. Not very tuned into the art world. <laughs> Grossman, on the other hand, knew what an original Warhol was worth. So when Bobby told him that he needed a sofa, Grossman was more than happy to give him one of his own ones in exchange for double Elvis. Oh wow. Cut to the early 80s when Bobby and I were living together in a house in Brentwood. We'd often hang out in the kitchen, drinking, eating, and talking about what we did that day and what we were up to. On one occasion, I could tell he was aggravated about something. When I asked him what was wrong, he said, they want me to sign more papers. Who does, I asked. Albert Grossman, my ex-manager from back in the 60s, he said. The guy took a huge percentage of the earnings from my songs and publishing back in the day, and now he wants me to sign more papers. What does your lawyer say about that? He says I should sign that, that you can't fight Elder. That sounded like terrible advice. After a little digging, I figured out what this attorney, why this attorney was urging Bobby to sign the papers. The guy represented Grossman as well. Oh, he represented both sides in the form of this contract. That is crazy, I thought. Clearly, it was a major conflict of interest. But Bobby persisted in thinking he had no choice. Nobody has ever beaten Albert. He kept saying, dispirited. For a guy who was as brave and brilliant as anybody I ever met, he could be very naive about things. And all the times he'd been managed by Grossman, he'd never read any of his contracts. He trusted the man completely. Bobby was 21 when he went with Grossman, so he was like a father figure to him. So he had, you know, he just, you know, he believed him. Don't sign anything, Bobby, I implored. This is outrageous and illegal. I'm going to get you a great attorney who will be on your side. Not only will we stop this nonsense, we're going to get you back your rights. The lawyer I had in mind was Frank Berman, an old fraternity brother of mine from the University of Minnesota who stayed a close friend ever since. Frank was based in the Twin Cities, not a big New York lawyer, or a Hollywood hotshot. He didn't even specialize in entertainment law. But I knew Frank was a tenacious, brilliant attorney who was not afraid of anything or anyone. I thought of him as a cross between Rocky and Alan Dershowitz. <laughs> That's how he is. Amazing, guy. I gazed across the kitchen table at my four long looking friend, who was still mumbling. No one has ever beat the bear. Well, Frank Berman could beat the bear, the damn bear. At least I hope so. Because Bobby was counting on me. It was one thing to fix a friend up on a bad blind date. But with something but this was something else. <laughs> I got another friend who I did fix up on a bad wife named Mickey Pucci, who still pissed off at me. <laughs> but <a> different consequences. <laughs> this was a war. And if we were going to start it, we better win it. It turned out that Frank had recently moved to LA. So a few days later he came to the house. 
But Bobby and I explained the situation. Frank looked like the back of his head was going to blow off. You can't have the same attorney represent both parties in forming a contract, he said. And he took an extremely high percentage of your rights. Give me all the documents you have since the beginning of your association with Grossman. Let me study them and we'll have another meeting. Bobby arranged to have all the documents sent to Frank's office. He reviewed them quickly and studied up on the applicable law. Then he called me. This is a complete disgrace, he said. He's got to fight this. When we met again, Frank reiterated to Bobby that the whole thing was outrageous, a blatant conflict of interest. The terms of the contract were onerous. They took advantage of your age and lack of business experience, he told Bobby. These contracts violate laws and ethics. Frank, I cut in. What can, what can be done about it? The first thing is to stop paying Albert any money at all. I'll write a letter challenging the validity of any contact, any contracts between them. Bobby was stunned. He thought of challenging Grossman of cutting him off was beyond his imagination. And Bobby had a pretty vivid, vivid imagination, <laughs> as we all know. He looked at me like a small boy in trouble. What should I do, Louie, he asked. Hire Frank and follow his directions, I said. You finally have someone to protect your rights. He returned to his old mantra. Elmer is the bear. No one has ever beaten him. To quote somebody I know, I said, greeting, the times they are changing. He smiled back, then he hired Frank. And the war began. And it was a war. The case went on for six years. Just before it was to go to trial, Grossman died of a heart attack on a flight to London. His, his wife, Sally, was his heir. Bobby contacted her, and they reached a settlement in the case. Bobby got all his rights back. The bear's tyrannical reign was over. And Mr. Tambourine Man had gotten justice. I'm just glad I was there to intervene on my friend's behalf. Just as Walter Yetnikoff, you gotta read the book because I have a story about Walter Yetnikoff before this. And not, he was the president of Columbia Records. And not intimidated me. I knew that Elbert Grossman was no bear. I knew he wasn't beyond the facts or above the law. And that it was high time for Bobby to get back what's rightfully his. Elbert was just another greedy, manipulative user hired to look out for the welfare of his client by taking advantage of him instead. Bobby didn't hide his gratitude for what Frank and I did. Unfortunately, though, Grossman did get one last laugh from beyond the grave. The silk screen that Andy Warhol had given to Bobby, which he had traded to Grossman for an old sofa, ultimately found a new home. In 1988, Sally Grossman sold double office at auction for $720,000. In 2012, it sold again at auction for $37 million. <laughs> oh, Expensive couch. <laughs> <laughs> so this gives you a taste wow. of some of the stories we're about. There's one more I think I'll read for you right. before we go to the Q&A. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. It's the encore. <laughs> you got an encore. <laughs> <laughs> You can have encores in book signings. We got one tonight. <laughs> Didn't get one last night, so this is good. <laughs> it was Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement. At the tail end of the 1980s, Bobby was attending services at the Harad House in Santa Monica. Presiding 
was the venerable rabbi Avraham Levitansky, beloved and revered by his congregation. We had been there before, and the rabbi recognized Bobby right away. But few, if any, of his fellow worshipers, all somberly dressed, realized he was standing at the back of the room. Having, as usual, missed the memo regarding the dress code, Bobby was wearing cowboy boots, torn jeans, a hoodie, a black leather jacket, and what looked like a long-lost pair of Jackie Kennedy sunglasses. Specifically, he was attending the Nila service. In Hebrew, Nila means closing the gate. As the day of Yom Kippur comes to a close and our future is being sealed, we turn to God to offer our repentance and new resolutions and ask that he seal us in the book of life. We ask him to grant us a new year replete with goodness and happiness. The Niwa ends with the blowing of the shofar. And the prayer that includes, next year they will be in Jerusalem. The ark housing the holy scrolls of the Torah remains open for the entire service. And it is considered a great honor to be chosen by the rabbi to open it. This carries with it many blessings for the new year. The honor customarily goes to the temples most generous donor, but not this time. With his ancient eyes, Rabbi Levitansky scoured the congregation. At last, his gaze came to rest upon a solitary figure standing in the back of the room. He motioned the casually dressed fellow up to the pulpit, and up he came. Bob Dylan opened the ark on Yom Kippur. Afterwards, when the last echo of the chauffeur had diminished to silence and most of the congregants had trickled away, the biggest story to the temple sought out Rabbi Levitansky and pulled him aside. I want you to know, Rabbi, said the man, that when you didn't call me up to Old Nard, I was quite hurt. Then I saw whom you chose, and I decided you were even wiser and kinder than I had imagined. So I'm going to double my contribution for the coming year. It takes a great, generous heart to give the honor of opening the ark for Nila to a homeless Jew. <laughs> the rabbi has long since passed away, taking his spiritual secrets with him. As for the donor, once he reads it here, he okay. still doesn't know that the homeless Jew was Bob Dill. The new book, Dylan and Me and the Homeless Jew, 50 Years of Adventures. A terrible murder! No. Woo! Uh, so we're going to do a Q&A now. Uh, uh, anybody want to start out asking a question? We got some time. Anything goes. Uh, back, come on up here. You want to come up here? So you can, people can hear you. Thank you. Anything at all? We have some Herzl Camp alumni here. Dick Cohn is here. If you want to ask Herzl questions, we'll go ahead. Hi, Louie. Thank you. This, this has been wonderful. And we probably have some shared memories. And I, I remember Melvin McCosh from the University of Minnesota. Yes. Yes. Were you with um, Bob at Newport? And what? No? Okay. I wasn't there. Yeah. I would love to be here. Yeah, so I wasn't there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All righty. Right here. I was just wondering if Frank, the lawyer, is still alive. He is. Is he in the Twin Cities? He still is in Minneapolis. I think he's uh, going to find it interesting when he reads the book. Oh. I think you'll find it very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right here. I don't really have a question, but I'd like to thank Louie for coming and telling us his stuff, and I'd like to thank Mark too for making sure that we all are Dylan fans and we have the questions to ask. 
Thank you for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Okay. Any other ones? Questions? Mark. Answers right here. Mr. Paul Metza. <clears throat> Louis, number one, I really enjoyed the book. And uh, so I have two questions. I'm going to pull commercial plug. I've got a TV show, and I'll be interviewing Louis on Wednesday, and it's going to be showing in the fall. I show all of our TV. Just go to paulmetz.com and learn all about it. But anyway, two questions. So we all know Bob is a very uh, private guy. And uh, so number one, well, maybe let's do this in the other order. Number one, what was it like writing the book with Kinky Friedman? How did that come about? What was that exchange? And then secondly, I know Bob's a very private guy. Was there any intrepidation about you finally coming out and telling these stories? Okay. Right. Well, what happened, the process was a little bit like this. For years and years, you know, I'd go to friends' houses and lunch and dinner, and they knew about my other friends, and they'd ask me to tell a story or two. And I'd, I'd tell them. And everybody always said to me, these stories are amazing, you have to write a book. And I'd say, yeah, yeah, one day I'm going to write a book. Not really thinking I was going to do it, but just, you know, get them off my back. You know. And uh, what happened three years ago was a very close friend of mine. Uh, his name was Spee Small. He was the producer of the Grammys for 21 years. In the last five years, he was producer of America's Dead Talent. He came down with cancer. And uh, I used to go visit him in Malibu, cheer him up. And one day when I went out there, I walk in, and uh, he says to me, the first thing he says, he had been after me, one of the people been after me to write this book. He said, when are you going to write the book? I said, oh, I don't know, one day. He said, you got to write it. I said, well, I'm not here to talk about that. I said, how are you feeling? He said, I feel like shit, but I want you to write this book. <laughs> this was six weeks, uh, six months before he died. He was on oxygen, chemo, and it's just you know, really in pain. It you know, just you know, broke my heart. And uh, But he stayed on my case until he got me to promise him that I write the book. And after he passed away, I said, I gotta keep my promise. And, and, I did. and Kinky. You know, Kinky was the only other person I knew that had written a book, so I called him and said, well, you know, how do you write a book? <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, he gave me some tools, and, and uh, he said, just, he said, your stories are great. Only you know these stories. Sit down and write them, and, uh, and I'll look at them, and I'll, if I can, I'll do some editing. So he edited with me about four or five chapters, and he wrote the foreword. And of course, uh, yeah, I think he's a real character over here for our friends for some time. The Texas Jew boy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was also on Rolling Thunder. Yes. Okay. On the second one. The producer of Rolling Thunder right here. Yeah. Woo! The true yeah. story is in the book. Sure. Well, yeah. The yeah. for Stacey movie, the true story is in the book. Yeah, you'll get, you'll get to read a lot about behind the scenes of the Rolling Thunder in the book. Any other questions? We got one over here. Right there. All right. Louis, first of all, thank you for writing the book. Um, all the excerpts we've heard and you're telling the stories tonight are, are excellent. The uh, question I have is, uh, in uh, Tangled Up in Blue, uh, in the opening of the song, um, it refers to a red-headed girl. And we, and from St. Paul, that were classmates, have an idea who it is, but uh, could you tell us? So i got to be honest with you. I never just asked Bob any questions about how he wrote these songs, who the influencers were, who the people were. Uh, that wasn't something that I would, you know, that was intrusive, I think. So I, I, I never did do that. So I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. And I will never say, of yeah. course. Okay, back there. Come on up here. Go. Actually, I, I don't have a question, but I, I want to get as close to you as I can. <laughs> I love ladies. Come on, Bob. We can get you right next. Because I'm a cousin of Bob's, okay, there you go. and I've never met him. Yeah. I know lots of cousins that haven't met him. But we are really a cousin. No, I believe you. Our grandmother was his great-grandfather's sister. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, that's Remember good. Sammy's pizza? Sammy's, all right, yes. So 
What's your name? What's your name? It's now the relative Q&A. All right, any other questions? Maybe we'll wrap it up. Anybody else? Let me uh, thank uh, the Iron Ranger for hosting tonight. Tom and Liz are awesome. This is an awesome place. Thank you, Tom and Liz. You're wonderful. And you got the patio open. We're going to hang out for a while. We're going to sign. You guys want to sign something here? Prefer, or we can sign up back. Step up, take some, uh, look through the book. We're going to have a good time. You guys are an awesome audience. I want to say I have posters and flyers. We're doing two more events. We're here tomorrow night down the street at the Next Chapter Bookseller. Come on out. We have 49 more years of adventures to go through. And uh, we're also going to be on Wednesday night wrapping it all up at Majors and Quinn Bookstore on Hennepin Avenue in Uptown Minneapolis. Then he's going back home. He's bringing it all back home. He's going to Duluth for a show at the Carpels Manuscript Library and Museum. Did I say that right? Where this guy has a rare Bob Dylan archive exhibit closing down that day. That's Thursday the 15th, and I'll give you all flyers if you want of that. Love to have you come out again. Go to DylanMe.com for updates on this. It's just coming out. It's on Amazon. It's on the website. It's going to go all the way over the country. He's going on Australian TV soon. So thank you all for coming. You're a wonderful crowd, and have a great night. Let's hear from Patrick.